Hi everyone, and welcome to the show. I can tell you that back in 1949 when they made these, this is an MGTC, long-legged and beautiful, but you had to be, you must have been five foot to get into this thing. You've got to fold yourself in and fold yourself out. It's quite a performance. Welcome to the show. Hope you had a good week. On the program today, we have Lady June Porter, who is a wonderful woman, probably the oldest published author in the world. She's 94, had a fantastic life. And also Keith Langley, who's an investment advisor, a stockbroker who will try and make some sense of this crazy economy in the world in which we are trying to live. And we've got lots of interesting topics and guests. Stay with us here in the Court of Public Opinion. Can't figure out what it's all about. You're always on my mind. Around the city, the state, the country and the world wide web. Uh, stay and enjoy the show. The topics we're taking to the street, we'll have a look at this uh, um, curfew on P-plate drivers. We'll also look at uh, social media, force for good, force for bad. A lot of bullying goes on and a lot of incorrect information, a lot of intimidation. But people couldn't live without social media these days. And uh, the other thing we'll look at is gun laws and uh, we'll see what else we can fit in when we head to the streets. Speaking of heading to the streets, yesterday I went down to Scammell's and I found this. It jumped out at me. I mean, this is a wonderful metaphor for the politics of the last week. Um, this is a short week and I'll bet there are people in Canberra being very grateful for the fact that it is a short week. But, you know, can you see? <laughs> it's a, mod a metaphor, <laughs> I won't say for which party, but I think you can guess. And uh, somebody was telling me that this, which is a profanity, uh, stands for, I never thought it stood for anything really, but it stands for store high in transit. Go figure. Anyway, the uh, P-plate curfew, which we'll have a look at when we get out there and talk to the people, I find that interesting, but way, way past time. But then again, I am of an age. If you were talking to somebody who was uh, 16, 17, 18, he or she would have a completely different opinion. First year P-plate drivers will be banned from driving between midnight and 5 a.m. And on the surface, you'd immediately say, that is a good idea. But what happens if, when I was that age, I had a job doing midnight to dawn? And how could you possibly do it? I think they've got to look at that sort of social driving as opposed to work oriented driving, that should be a different thing. But when you look at the statistics, it's pretty hard to ignore the fact that um, so many young people have died. 40 young P-platers have died on the state's roads since 2009, and if you extrapolated that throughout Australia, and I must tell you that these sort of laws, while a lot of people in South Australia might think of them as draconian, they're pretty standard all over Australia and all over the world. Uh, young people make up 5% of our population but account for something like 12% of the fatalities and we can't just let that go on. We'll have a look at that later here in the Court of Public Opinion. The Court of Public Opinion, the program that shoots the breeze but never the messenger. I see that um, they want to ban puppies from uh, retirement villages. And I can't get my mind around that, but later in the program we'll find some time to have a talk about it. If you're having a birthday today, happy birthday. Um, what can I tell you? The Earl of Cardigan, who led the charge of the Light Brigade. There is a poster over there in honour of the, uh, well, the charge of the Light Brigade anyway, the movie. Um, he died at the Battle of, uh, well, he fought at the Battle of Balaclava. He died this day in 1868. Germany mounted its final V2 rocket attack on Britain. And here's one that we should have done last week. 18, 1886 was the year. And English editor Edward Smith Hall, who came to Australia and published the first free press. And the campaign that he launched to have that free press landed him in jail for criminal libel. Anyway, he was born this day in 17, 
86. So if it's your birthday, I hope it'll be a really good one. Now, Keith Langley, my special guest, is going to make some sense of the world economy and all that's going on. Keith, welcome to the show. I don't know how you fit all of this on a business card. Share broker <laughs> and investment advisor, senior fellow of Financial Services Australasia, life member of the Financial Services Australasia in 05, that's when they made you for services to the industry a life member, uh, fellow of the Stockbrokers Association. You must have one hell of a business card. Well, I don't put it all on my business card, Jeremy. <laughs> it's very impressive. Well, I've been around for a while. Yeah, yeah. Does it get easier to understand or more complicated? Well, it is very, it's more complicated, but when you look through the complications, it's often the same old themes come through. The same old... Um, um, themes, as I said, come, come through because you, you have to rely on uh, income. In yeah. the, so if you look at the income, that often tells you whether your investments are performing well. Uh, mm. You have to look at the volatility of some of your investments to see whether there's um, two different opinions as to whether uh, some people think they're good buying or good selling. Mm. So those, those themes uh, and those indicators have been around since time immemorial, really. What scares me is that it seems to be without a lot of logic. There's a lot of emotion. There's a lot of, uh, you know, gossip and rumor and innuendo and, and suddenly there's a, uh, everyone's out buying or suddenly yeah. everyone's out selling. selling. Yes. Um, Where does that come well, from? Well, that, that does come from events that uh, sometimes uh, uh, move the markets in the short term. But again, the long term fundamentals ultimately shine through. Mm. As I said, income's important to a lot of investors and a steady and growing income stream uh, is actually fundamental. And solid companies, companies that are uh, in long term industries and long term companies that have uh, sound balance sheets yeah. uh, and are properly capitalised and well managed uh, time and time again. So, do we uh, do our homework and look at all of that, or do we say to our friendly stockbroker, you tell me, thinking, well, he would be knowledgeable about you know, what people were carrying debt, how companies were managed, were they well managed? Sure. Um, well, that's really our role, and uh, I don't think a lot of people realise that our dominant role is advice. Our very dominant role is research too, and uh, we uh, rely heavily on internal research. Have you ever been horribly wrong? Yes, we have been. Um, I don't know about horribly, but we have been wrong. And, and look, nobody gets it. Nobody gets it right all the time. And secondly, events sometimes overtake company fundamentals. There may be a sudden change uh, in, um, in product design or, or a new product comes on and uh, supersedes what somebody's been selling for years. Uh, that's certainly the case in high tech. Yeah. Um, so uh, I think the important thing with all this is not to be too reliant on any one company. In other words, don't have all your eggs in one basket. Now that okay. has been a theme, that has been a rule since investing started. Yeah, what about the relationship? Because the world is getting smaller. It just seems that, you know, they say, if America uh, catches a cold, we die of pneumonia, that sort of thing. I mean, and yet you look at the American economy and it seems to be pretty flat. Uh, they're printing money, trying to pump it up. Yes. Japan has been in recession for what, 20 years? Yes. Talking about America, um, that, is, that is the pervading view, but in reality the American economy is picking up. I think the stock market's telling you that, and the stock market is a lead indicator. Mm. And um, usually when the market goes up, the fundamentals underlying the businesses uh, are on the improve. Would you and be buying or would you be selling now? I, I think um, there's been certainly good investing in America and I think the American economy is going to continue to improve so I would be buying. Do you worry about China? Yes, you worry about China, you worry about America and China um, but um, China is a big engine, a very big engine which is a big, bigger and bigger consumer of all things, whether it be food, whether it be manufactured goods. Yeah. Um, and uh, they um, are using our raw materials, as you know, iron ore, sure. uh, et cetera. So I think there's a lot more growth to come out of China. I think they're going to be big consumers of our energy too. Mm. 
Cyprus has obviously been a problem, but I guess Iceland was a problem as well. But I heard the other night that uh, these banks teetering on the edge of uh, insolvency or bankruptcy, the average account in a Cypriot bank was $80 million. Yes. It's a very large amount of money. Very wealthy <laughs> little community. <laughs> the I average depositor. Okay. 80 million in the bank. I, I must say, I haven't spent much time reading about uh, uh, Cyprus. Um, it looks as though there's a lot of foreign money in the, uh, in the Cypriot banks. A lot of uh, hot money, too. And, and maybe a lot of hot money. <laughs> and the hot money may well have got caught. <laughs> but yes, but what a wonderful scam, yeah. because the money you can't account for, you yeah. stick in a little bank in, in Cyprus, uh, well, and then you can't really complain about it because you're not supposed to have it. We, we've, ha we've had that problem, as you mentioned, with Iceland. And uh, where um, there has been a, uh, uh, a lot of international money flowing around the world, it, it creates distortions. Yeah. A and... Um, once you, once you become reliant upon it, it well, can be quite dangerous. Well, Cyprus is only, what, uh, 0 0.01 or 0 0.02 per cent of the European uh, economy, so yeah. it hardly can tip the world upside down, can it? Sure. It's, it's nasty, but it's not big enough to cause serious long-term damage. Now, just quickly, I, I saw this Swiss referendum where they, they have a referendum in Switzerland at the drop of a hat, apparently. Uh, they decided to go out and ask people whether or not, you know, the golden handshake for executives or the golden parachute or the golden handcuffs, yes. or uh, le le lest I not go on there, but there's a lot of gold flowing <laughs> around. Uh, but they want to limit the amount of money uh, or largesse that can be given to a senior executive or a senior executive upon arrival or departure. Mm, what right. do you think of that? Well, I I've always taken the view that it's up to the board of directors mm. to... Um, uh, set CEO remuneration. There's a lot of factors in, involved in uh, setting a remuneration. Uh, not only uh, the local the local situation, but of course, a lot of CEOs now can get jobs in other countries. So s remuneration has to be competitive. I think it got to the point where it was over. People were overcompensated, but I think we have to be very careful not to let the s the pendulum swing back and mm. see these very experienced CEOs going elsewhere. Yeah, Especially I know, now the American economy is picking up. I know, but Mr. Kloppers leaves uh, BHP Billiton, and I think uh, if, you, if you take extrapolate it forward, yeah. it's about $60 million right. to say goodbye. And how long? I think the thing you've got to say to yourself is these jobs are probably 15 hours a day most days of the year. Uh, mm. So there is that element in it. He would be constantly travelling. He's mm. got huge responsibilities, both uh, financial and um, occupational health and safety responsibilities throughout yeah. the whole company. Uh, and m as you've seen, most of these jobs only last five years, five yep. or seven years. Now I say to myself, okay, that is a huge amount of money. Is it justified? It's very hard to read. But when I see what tennis players earn and what film stars earn and footballers earn... Golfers, they do pretty they, well too. They, they do. <laughs> and as, as I said, these CEO jobs, these high-level international CEO jobs really only last five or seven years. Mm. And, and the person is virtually burnt out. Yeah. Great. Uh, I'm, I'm tempted to say, have you got a tip? <laughs> but I haven't. I, I, I think the, uh, the tip is that I think um, we're through the worst and I think the Australian economy I is going to continue to motor along quietly. Uh, there's no boom in it. Uh, I think interest rates may fall a little bit further, but not much. And I think... Um, there's some still great opportunities for the long-term investor who are uh, earnings conscious, who are uh, dependent mm. on dividends. So there's still some very good dividend yields out there. Keith Langley, thank you so much. It's a pleasure. The Court nice of Public Opinion. Now, if you'd like to get in touch with us, um, email address, and this social media and uh, all of that, stuff is confusing to me but I know it is enormously influential and lots of people rely upon it and can't live without it so if you want to get in touch with us with a brick bat or a bouquet you can uh, the address is opinion at 44 Adelaide 
www.com.au. It's as simple as that. And I can never remember it. <laughs> <laughs> to my absolute chagrin. Now, my next guest is a wonderful lady, a fantastic, fascinating lady. Um, and I don't really know how to begin this. Lady June Porter, um, I feel a little bit like Elizabeth Taylor's ninth husband on his wedding night. Heavens. <laughs> I know exactly what to do, but I don't know how to make it interesting. Which... <laughs> Well, I don't know quite how to respond to that. Well, I, I, you've had wonderful publicity about this book. I mean, everything I've picked up and heard, there you've been, doing this wonderful sort of almost living history. You have seen so much. And by the way, I don't believe you're 94 years old. Thank you very much. You couldn't be 94. Sometimes I feel like 194. Oh. I have this week, actually. Well, I'd love to know what your secret <laughs> no. is. Oh, well, uh, that's my secret. Elizabeth Taylor's secret. <laughs> yeah, many husbands. <laughs> only one. You only had only one. Only one. No. Well, I, I, but most people think that's very boring. But I thought it was wonderful. Well, if you if you have the right one, it saves a lot of trouble, and uh, it's a lot simpler. Now, what I did, worrying about how to interview this wonderful lady who has seen so much and been everywhere, uh, I know about you know, the, the Indian connection. I looked around this garage, which is filled with stuff, you might have <laughs> noticed, and I found a couple of things that might make you feel at home. Um, there's my friend here, Erasmus. He's not real. I didn't <laughs> shoot him. And uh, that's Dimbleby Duck there, and I didn't shoot him yeah. either. But, but reading the book, you did. You actually went out there and went on safari, didn't you? Yes, yes, I did. Uh, well, I don't think they call it safari then. Mm. Uh, they, it was, it, they were shoots that were organised by, usually by Maharajas. I don't know any white man actually ever organised a shoot. Uh, a, they were extremely expensive. Mostly they were, they were in the province of Maharaja, in the Maharaja's own estate. Um, and they would, they would shoot tigers that were often a very great nuisance to, to the farmers. They'd be, uh, kill the, the farmers' cattle and so yes. forth, which yes. is their livelihood. So they weren't looked upon and frowned upon as much as they are today. I don't think I could do it again today. No, it's a different world. I mean, it, people totally. did things at that time that, that would have been pretty shocking by today's standards. Yes, and I, I don't know why people didn't think it was shocking then, but uh, my, my husband's diary, on one shoot we were on, uh, he writes, uh, I had a beautiful samba in my, in my sights, but I didn't have the heart to pull the trigger. Mm. And uh, so I think, you know, this was sort of beginning, people were beginning to feel <coughs> that it wasn't quite, <coughs> excuse me, it wasn't quite the thing to do. India back then... <coughs> um, was it, 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 it seemed to me, the sort of image that I have of India, to a certain extent even today, enormous wealth, living side yes, by side with great <coughs> poverty. Mm, absolutely. <coughs> Sorry about my voice. <coughs> You've been my doing throat. too many interviews. No, too many interviews. <laughs> <coughs> Sorry about that. Uh, yes, there was, it was amazing wealth mm. and, uh, and luxury and a totally different sort of thing I'd ever been used to. And the poverty was something I'd never seen before. But there was so much everywhere that people took it for granted. And there, it, was, um, it was rather horrifying, really. But when you lived among it for so long, it became part of everyday life. Mm. You, you obviously moved in that circle of, of uh, uh, the Mountbatten's. Yes. Uh, um, well, the Mount, Mount Batten stayed with us all the time oh. at the government house, and I saw, I saw them frequently, and uh, had lunch, dinner with them, and Lady Louie used to, she flew up to Ranchi, which was the forward hospital area for troops coming out of Burma, mm. <coughs> and she came up there to inspect the hospitals when she was visiting India, <coughs> and uh, I spent the day with her going around hospitals, and she was an amazing person, just the most fascinating creature, person and personality mm. you could find. <coughs> I do apologise about my voice. No, 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 no. I read a book about <coughs> her, Edwina Mountbatten, and it seemed that uh, she was not only a great character, but um, how do I put this? Um, 
not notorious, um, insatiable? Yeah. Yes, I think so. But she had a great mind. She was like her grandfather, Sir Edward Castles, who was the f financier to Edward the Seventh. Um, and the war really brought out the best in her. Mm. Before the war, she'd just been a rich playgirl. But when the war came along, and she formed the, the ATS, the ATS, the Auxiliary Territorial Service, <clears throat> which were women that went did men's jobs basically to release men for for battle in the war mm. and she was a terrific organizer and had her finger on the pulse of everything she had the her great ability came out during the war mm. adversity sometimes does that doesn't it, it absolutely it just the, the circumstances mm. yep. can make the person one way or the other um, most vivid <laughs> memory of of that era because you would have vivid memories of all sorts of things in your wonderful life that spanned the my world. My memory of everything there is as clear as today. And when I was reading my mother's letters, which was a very traumatic experience, I hadn't read the letters since I'd written them 70 years ago. And, but it was just as though I was there. I described everything to her in great detail. And I could have described it without the letters if anyone had asked me about it. It was really... Mm. Quite amazing. I relived my life. Yeah. Kings, totally. and, kings and queens and maharajas. Who, who, was, who was the most memorable, most interesting person well, you I ever met? Well, I wondered about that. And, of course, there were many. But I think one was someone called um, Major General Adrian Carton Duart. Mm. He had been in the Boer War. He was a Belgian and Irish, a very aristocratic uh, descent. In fact, it was rumoured that he was the illegitimate son of the King of the Belgians. He had been World War, War World War I, where he'd been shot in the face, um, lost an eye, bit off his fingers when the surgeon would not amputate them. He um, went, then went back into battle. He was amazing bravery. He was in World War, when World War II came along, he went, was in that again. And then he, he was shot down uh, in the Mediterranean, swam ashore, was captured by the Germans in Syria, tunnelled his way out of a prisoner <laughs> of war camp. It was unreal. And uh, then he was, Churchill made him his special representative in China. And he then came on his way to China, came and stayed with us at gov Government House in Calcutta. And he had every decoration, VC, KB, you know, every, every initial in the alphabet. And... Uh, he had a patch over one eye and, a, and a, a, an empty sleeve mm. and had the greatest charisma you could ever believe. Did you fall in love with him? Mo absolutely. <laughs> Everybody did. He was, he was a real Scarlet Pimpernel character. Mm. Mm. And I think he probably would have been one of the most impressive people I'd met. All of that, and then you come to Adelaide, which must have seemed very quiet. Well, yes, it was. <laughs> but we were kept very Ooh. busy. Was when Tom yes. became Lord Mayor. Yes, yes, yes. We, we were yes. extremely busy, and so we you know we things weren't as quiet as they might have been. Now clear something up. Um, I would think you were the oldest published author in the world. I think I probably am. I don't know if anyone else of '94 has written a book. No, well, I suggested that here and. Uh, someone on the crew googled it because this is the yes. awful thing about social media you know people just assume that just yes. because it's on the world wide web it's right. it's right but but there was somebody 98 but uh, that it didn't say whether that person was still around so i i give you the title ma'am thank you very much i think i have to get on google i think i am <laughs> maybe i get to get a book of records yes i well, should i keep ignoring it hoping it'll go away mm. but it doesn't seem to it seems to have found its spot in everyone's life except mine it's wonderful to see you it Thank really you. is. Thank you very much. And congratulations. Thank you for having me on the on program. This. And you waited a long time to write it. Uh, but thank years. you for doing it. <laughs> thank you. It's wonderful to see you. Okay. Lady June Porter, and this is the book, Can a Duck Swim? Now, this is why Dimbleby's here, because Lady Porter and ducks seem to go together. So that's the book. And a really, really good read. The Court of Public Opinion. The Court of Public Opinion, and I hope you're enjoying the program these days. 
right around Australia and indeed the world on this World Wide Web thing, which has <laughs> great relevance to everyone in the world except me. Let me introduce you to our panel, which we call a jury. Uh, Marina Hamilton Craig, and I've got to make sure I get the Hamilton in there because I've always known you as Marina Craig, so it's now Marina Hamilton Craig, which is your real name, isn't it? That's my real name. In the old days, uh, I wanted to be in the telephone book. It, my husband was in the phone book, so it was my way of not people not finding me. If they'd look under C, they would never think of looking me un under H. So that was my little bit I of privacy. See. Because you had yeah. this wonderful career at the Advertiser and the Sunday Mail, and you had a very public life, so I can understand Yes, you that, didn't, want, didn't want people ringing up at home, but and if one of us had to be in the... Uh, telephone directory, which Ian did have yes. to be, um, it just g gave me that measure of privacy. That and I love double-barreled names. They're wonderful. Oh. Hyphenated. I always wanted a hyphen. Oh, well, I, 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 when people say, because I used to be Miss Craig, and people say Mrs. Hamilton Craig, I think my mother-in-law is standing <laughs> behind me. Scott McBain, who's standing behind you? Uh, nobody in my name's always been the same. I just <laughs> want to uh, clear that up for the records. <laughs> yeah. from, from right. the time I started to right now, quite possibly when I finished. Welcome. And Saxon Cordo, uh, uh, Caroline has had to fly off. Her mother's not terribly well, so Saxon grabbed him out of the garden, and he, volu <laughs> no, he volunteered. <laughs> That's that whole sort <laughs> of stork, yeah, that no, that stork cabbage thing well, going on, isn't it? You're a yeah. big one, weren't you? Well, I don't know how he you, got me out of the ground. <laughs> you, you represent a slightly younger demographic, and for this Ooh. first oh, story... Oh, Shall we leave now? No, 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 no. We have experience on our side. Absolutely. Oh, Lord, I wouldn't like to be 30 again, or 30 five or whatever you are. Uh, first, <laughs> you never remember your children's birthdays. Uh, first year P-plate drivers will be banned from driving between midnight and 5 a.m., prohibited from carrying more than one passenger, age 16 to 20, and uh, they won't get their full license until they turn 20. Now, in the street, this is what you think. I don't know, just, I mean, they've got to get around late at night too. If kids work, you know, late nights and that sort of thing, and it may affect their work, so, but, you know, there should be stricter rules on, you know, who can get licenses, and, you know, if they do have a, if they're original people at driving in New Orleans, but if they've lost their license and are now at people at it for the second time, then, yeah, maybe can enforce some rules on them. I think that probably they do. I think that anything past about one o'clock at night is probably unnecessary and is, um, I guess, endangering one to... Uh, elements and to circumstances that they probably shouldn't be exposed to at their level of experience. So, yeah, I'd probably say it doesn't need to be ridiculous, but something like one o'clock or, or along those lines, AM, uh, would probably be a reasonable time. Uh, anything beyond that, I think, is unnecessary. It appears that uh, early morning is uh, not a good time for them, uh, particularly in bad weather. Uh, I'd be against it. I'd be, I'd be for having the curfew, yes. With regarding the pee places, I, my daughter's actually going to get her going for her licence and she doesn't agree with it. But I think I wouldn't want her to be driving later at night anyway, so I think it's probably a sensible decision. It just seems ridiculous. Uh, got to give everyone the opportunity to develop their own learning skills, whether it's day or night. And I just think it's, net, it's uh, parental controls have gone too far. Yes, because too many young people die and uh, there's no reason like, to let them go without that they are irresponsible when they're all together. Marina, I don't know uh, whether or not you would worry about kids in cars, but as a parent, I was always petrified. Absolutely. And even though it, it sounds a little draconian, I do think that anything that stops young people dying on the road is worth looking at. Yes. I think probably as long as it's going to be an experiment, not something they bring in that lasts forever, but if they say let's try it for three months or six months and it really does bring down the rate of young people injured or dying on the road, I think it's worth a try. Yes. I don't think we should look at it as the solution. No, but Scott, it's kind of only bringing us into line with the rest of the country and many other countries overseas. Uh, or well, not being completely au okay fait with, you know, with every other state's um, mm. laws and regulations pertaining to driving. I mean, my first concern as a, as a country boy um, and as somebody who relied on a licence from a very early age is, yet again, um, it really is uh, sort of something that country kids are going to feel the most because sport on a weekend, things like that, you know, one car, four kids in the car to go to a game 30, 40, 50, 60 k's away. 
Mm. They are the people that are going to feel this. Uh, and, you know, midnight, really? I mean, what is this, Cinderella or something? We're going to turn into pumpkins? No, I have a, ba I have a, I have a saying, and it, it, <laughs> it's one that Saxon does not agree with, and that is that nothing good happens after midnight. Well, and he tells me nothing up. good yeah. happens before yeah. midnight. Stay up one night. <laughs> Education. Education is what's needed. Not, All right. Not convoluted laws. Saxon, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I can, I can kind of agree with that. Education would be the key. It seems like they're treating symptoms, not the cause. Mm. I mean, when I had my license, uh, I think I got my L's at 15, seven months, got my P's at 16, and uh, full license at 17 or something. So these days, you've got to have your P's for three years, which I find ridiculous, and, and with only a few points for three years, mm. which, uh, which is, which is yeah. crazy. I think if the, if the problem is kids are getting killed on the road, well, maybe there should be uh, you know, a better way to uh, teach them how to drive, you know, give them better skills. But there's always going to be idiots. Yeah, well, I heard somebody say this morning that uh, we, we don't have the same number of aeroplane accidents that we have on the road. Uh, and his, his logic was, well, the training, mm. the retraining, uh, the constant vigilance as to performance and excellence and rules for flying. Well, you don't get it yeah. driving. That's true. Mm. But there are some exclusions. Oh, First of all, the fine, $317 and three demerit points for breaking uh, or breaching the curfew. Mm. Uh, and not many kids in their late teens would be able to pay that, so it would come back to mum and dad. An exemption on the one passenger rule for family members, but it would be okay if it was your girlfriend or your boyfriend. Exemptions on the curfew and one passenger rule if an adult full licensed driver with a clean driving record. Is there such a thing? Um, well, maybe how, how one clean? Or two. How clean? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, there's some work exemption too for people who have to drive after midnight and for police and emergency workers and volunteers. But if they put it on as a trial, mm. I think, although the advertiser doesn't say it's a trial, it's going to be something, I guess, that will be debated in the court of public opinion. Now, here's an interesting question. We all know that this, the Pope has stepped aside at the age of 85, 86. Piece of um, history-making decision. Uh, I think the, the, the last pope that stepped aside or retired was 600 years ago right. or something. Now, at what point, the Queen is about the same age, at what point should the Queen step aside and allow Charles, while he you know, still has his marbles and his energy, to have a bit of a go? What do you think, Marina? Oh, I love the Queen. I'd be so sad to see her. I think that she wasn't, she wasn't born to be queen. You know, she was the Duke of York's daughter. Yes. I'm sure Lady Porter would put, put me right on that. But uh, so like Fergie's two children, you know, they, they were going, two young women who were just going to have a lovely life. Yes. And then her uncle abdicated and she became se you know, second in line after her father. And she has done it beautifully. Yes. She's never put a foot wrong. Great sense of duty. Yeah. And she has never put anything ahead of that duty. And her mother was very long-lived yes. and, and very uh, active as Queen, of mo uh, Queen Mother. Yes. So I I'd like to have the Queen a little bit longer. I do see that, for example, the Republican movement and so on, they would think that that would be a time, you know, they don't want to hurt the Queen's feelings, and that mm. might be a time I for change. I think they're scared of her. <laughs> oh, no, she's so oh. sweet. I, I well, mean, I, I think she's... Not she's, sweet, but she's a wonderful woman. Yeah, oh, I think she is a fantastic yes, woman. And, and mm -hmm. she, she, will, uh, she has held together that family and that nation uh, in some extremely difficult circumstances. I can't imagine people having anything but admiration for her. Scott, what do you think? Uh, look, I, I'm not sure whether I really have a particular opinion on it. I mean, uh, she's doing a pretty good job from what I can see. Mm. Uh, I mean, you know, Ronald Reagan was an old... Uh, President of the United States. The Pope's been recently uh, replaced by a young whippersnapper of, what, 76 or something like that. <laughs> yes. So uh, 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 maybe Charles is a bit young to step up yet. Yes, I don't think uh, it should be an excuse to uh, nice. turn Australia into a, a republic, yeah, yeah. but I, I do see that it must be a terrible strain on a woman of that age to go on with the responsibilities mm -hmm. and duties that she, she does. Sex? Well, I, I don't 
sure either. I mean, traditionally, I think people in succession have to wait for the king or the queen at the time to mm. actually die. But back in the good old days, you could probably poison them a lot easier than <laughs> you can today and get away with it. Yeah. Uh, but it would be all over social media mm. if they tried that. Yes, exactly. Well, you, can't, you can't do it today. Poor, poor mm. Charles, you know, yeah, you just can't do it. Mm. Um, uh, you know, he who has the gold makes the rules. She's got the gold, she's got the crown, she can do what she yes. wants. But, uh, I hope it's again, what she wants to do and not what she feels she has mm, to do. Because yeah. she said she would, she would, it was a pledge that she made to her people that she would serve those people all her life. Yes, right. yes. And then, you know, sharing is caring. Yeah. Sharing is caring. And I'm sure Charles would agree with me. Here's what so. you think. <laughs> Being a Republican, I don't really care, but, <laughs> but um, look, uh, I think she's, uh, she's been here long enough, and um, poor Charles, he, he, he's just waiting there. He really wants to have a go, doesn't he? So uh, I, I think, yeah, I, I think that would be a good thing to do. I guess the, the question has to be asked, you know, what would that gain um, if, that was, if there was going to be some sort of advantage in the way the Commonwealth has managed, uh, then yeah, absolutely. But if the Queen isn't actually doing her job uh, to the best of her ability and the best of the needs of that role, then, you know, maybe that would need to be reviewed. Well, she's been a wonderful um, leader, hasn't she? Um, I think it's time, yes. And Charlie would be great, I think. As a royalist, I think Charlie would be great. That's a very difficult question. No, I think she should go on until she feels comfortable that it's time. And then, you know, obviously Queen Beatrix did this, something like that in the Netherlands, and uh, that was a fine idea, but I think... No, I think in this case, let her just uh, continue on until she's ready to stand down. Not necessarily. I think she has done a sterling job. And uh, who knows, it may not be for much longer anyway, given her age, before Prince Charles can take her. No, I think it will take its natural course. Now, gun laws. Gun laws. Why don't I start with... Saxon, do you have an opinion on guns? I mean, I, I'm a collector and I have books <coughs> on guns and I love them. I don't know that you've got the same sort of uh, connection, but what do you think? Well, I mean, personally, I like guns. I like, you know, uh, target shooting. I like squeezing off a few rounds. I'd never use, use a, you know, a pistol or a rifle to kill anything. Um, I, I, I have fun with them. Um, tightening the laws, uh, you know, it, it's, not, it's not the legal guns and people who hold the, the licenses that are the problem. It's, it's the criminal element in society that has the illegal guns on the black market that, that are the problem. I don't think tightening the rules any further for, for law-abiding citizens is, is necessarily the answer, but you know they do some pretty good background checks if you want to get your gun license. Oh, they, here? Yeah. yeah. They, so yeah. I, I, don't, I don't really see too much, too much point in it. No. Yeah. Scott? Um, yeah, look, I, I tend to agree with Saxon. I mean, I, again, my country background, I've hunted, I've shot for food to eat. Um, that's just what you did. I've shot foxes to sell mm. their skins, you mm. know, to make a living. Um, but the connection between mental illness and these crazy yeah. shooting sprees, uh, you see, you can't really readily control mental illness, no. but you can control guns. So they go for the effect, not the cause, in many cases. And, and the other thing I think is is that the penalties. We need to look. We need to look at the legal side of it because at the moment, you know, it's a slap on the wrist. You get caught with an illegal handgun. You back. You, you know, there, there's nothing. If you're going to get serious about it, mm. you know, make it a serious punishment to yeah. fit what is, you know, effectively a serious crime. And that is being in possession and using an illegal handgun. Or you could say, uh, if you get caught uh, committing a crime with a gun, mm. you go to jail for life. Well, I think, you know, if people are really mentally ill, they're, they're probably not thinking long term. Mm. Uh, there's maybe, you know, psych evaluations. I don't think that's happening. Uh, maybe no, that should, I don't maybe think so. Maybe that should be... A, mm. No, I don't think they, they, there's any sort of check like that when you go for your licence. Marina, Mayor Bloomberg is spending, I don't know how many billions he's got, but he's spending $20 million on a campaign to try and tighten the gun laws in America. He, he's aiming it, if I can use that expression, <laughs> at the National Rifle Association. He's using his wealth to change America. Do you think that's going to get anywhere? I don't know. Uh, you know he, he is rich and he's powerful. Yes. But you know, all this talk about guns, we, well, we haven't really defined what a gun is. A gun is a machine which is only designed for two purposes, mm. to kill and to wound. 
I mean, it's a pretty serious machine and you have to be very careful who it's given to. Yes. I mean, obviously the military, the police, um, farmers just, you know, looking after their land yeah, and, and perhaps um, security people who, yes. who are well trained, who are trained to use but them. But what about uh, our, our sports people who go overseas and oh. they bring back a gold medal because they're a good shot? That's the mm. same with bow and arrow. I mean, they were exactly yes. designed to wound or kill. I mean, it has been a sport, but it must be carefully controlled, you know. Yes. The people, you but need why not control the crooks? Why put all that effort into controlling law-abiding people? That's easy. Well, controlling the crooks is hard. That's exactly what we're talking about yeah. driving. Yeah. You know, the good drivers are being penalised, if you want the word, for the ones who are potentially bad drivers. Mm. That, that always happens. I no, I was, I was, sorry? So I was just going to say, I think if you, um, you know, if you give a knife to, to a surgeon, you'll use it to save lives. You can give the same knife to a killer, you'll use it to take lives. Mm. It's not the knife that's the problem. It's it's something wrong in, in society that needs to yes, be addressed. Yes, that's yeah. pretty profound. Anyway, I was a bit nervous taking this to the street, but I'm glad I did. Here's what you think. Uh, not strong enough. God forbid we're ever as bad as the United States. We're much better than the United States. But I understand there's as many guns now as there were before Howard, uh, Prime Minister Howard, introduced um, strict gun controls. But uh, criminals will always find ways and means to get guns and... Uh, we need to tighten up, we really do. Uh, well, Australia's taken a lead internationally. Uh, John Howard took a great initiative as far as taking guns out of the system. So they, they stand up internationally. So I think that's a great thing. I think America's an absolute disgrace. So I think uh, we can be pretty proud in that respect and should stay ever vigilant. My concern is that Australia, very much following a lot of the American model, could end up in the scenario where we've become like American society as has happened in many, many areas. Um, and I think it's been shown to, to the nth degree that guns in America have been the cause and continue to be the cause of mass slayings and dreadful behaviour. I think um, the fact that people are required to um, to be licensed and before they actually get a gun license they have to go fairly strict stringent testing so I think that's a really good idea so I think it's a tape course or something like that so yeah. don't know a lot, lot about them um, I'm not uh, I'm not a gun person myself um, I think the laws are adequate at the present moment. No not happy with them at all. No we don't like the they they may have been reclaimed but um, they're not not looking after them, you know, they're not policing them enough. Now, um, what I might do is just remind you of that um, email address, which I've taken the advantage here to write down so I do get it right. It's opinion at 44adelaide.com.au. And why I give it to you again is if you have something that you think you would like to put before the court of public opinion and the jury, it can be controversial, it can be local, national, international something that you think needs talking about, send it off. We'd be very happy to get it. Marina, thanks for coming. It's been a joy. I, I, will you come back? I will. I'd love you to. Scott? Jeremy? Saxon? Thanks for having me. The Court of Public Opinion. Betty has been roaming around town looking at all kinds of things that will fascinate us upcoming in the world of entertainment. Thank you for doing that. You have boundless energy. Do you think so? Yes. Oh, well, I love the Listen, world before you get into that, yes. did, did you ever see Groundhog Day, the Bill Murray movie? No, but you know what? Uh, Don Ronaldo from Cruise yes. has told me that I need to see that because apparently it's about my life. Can you explain, <laughs> explain that to no, me? No, you've got to see it. You've got to see it. But <laughs> okay. why I bring it up is... Puxatawney Phil. Puxatawney mm -hmm. Phil is facing a criminal indictment for falsely predicting an early spring. Tradition has it that winter will end quickly if the rodent sees his shadow after emerging from his western Pennsylvanian lair on February 2. And this is a tradition that goes back uh, hundreds and hundreds of years. Well, Phil saw his shadow this year, but his prediction was dead wrong. Spring arrived on Wednesday and temperatures are still hovering 20 degrees below freezing. And this is what the Attorney General has said. Pux Attorney Phil did purposely and with prior consultation and design cause the people to believe that spring would come early. 
Mike Grosser, prosecutor and attorney general, or whatever they call them over there, southwestern Ohio, Butler County, and it was a very official looking indictment that he was uh, waving around in the air. Puxatawney Phil is a groundhog. <laughs> very well voiced too, Jeremy. Thank oh. you. You put a lot of expression into that. I loved it. Pucks a tawny fill. <laughs> I love that. Now, what's coming up? Well, I need you to have a look at this. Have a look at this. This is going to be spectacular. It's called Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. That's a curious name for a motor car. But that's the sound it makes. Listen. Chitty Bang Bang, Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. Chitty Bang Bang, Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. Chitty Bang Bang, Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. Okay. Chitty Chitty Bang Bang is currently in Melbourne. It's had its season in Sydney and it's coming to Adelaide at the end of April. This is going to be amazing for the whole family. It's a flying car. It's a flying car. It's spectacular costumes. Look, you know it's Ian uh, Fleming's story. Yes. The score is, uh, is remaining the same. However, they are putting a few new songs in there just to bring it into yeah. you know, the 21st century. I'm surprised they don't get Chitty Chitty Bang Bang and Driving Miss Daisy and put them both together. That'd be great. Yes, in the, in the garage. In the garage, that's right. <laughs> well, anyway, for those who don't know Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, it's based on the 1968 MGM film of the same name, and it's action-packed, which features a company of over 70. Now, there yeah. are eight dogs that are yeah. also in this cast, and over 500 costumes and hats, and the show centres on Old Chitty, the yeah. magical car yeah. that sails the seas and flies, and it's an eccentric inventor, and his two children want to... Uh, you know, who's got the lead? Dick Van Dyke had the lead in the movie. The lead. Hmm. It stars uh, David Hobson, Rachel Beck, and, and George Capignaris. As you know, Adelaide's adopted oh, yeah, son. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, he, he plays the Bulgarian spy. Mm -hmm. So this is a multi-million dollar production, and it remains the longest running musical ever to play at the London Palladium. And Chitty holds a Guinness uh, World Record for the most expensive stage prop in the history of British theatre. Yeah, well, it'll be something spectacular, wouldn't it? Yes. So end yeah. of April. Okay. And uh, another one that I am totally excited about is Jesus Christ Superstar. Did you ever see it in the seventies? Yes. Yes, I did. Um, and I, I've got a funny feeling they should leave it there because. I can't imagine how they would update it and improve it and make it better. Well, they're bringing it into the 21st century. Apparently, Andrew Lloyd Webber on opening night in London. It wasn't that long ago. <laughs> Seems like just yesterday, actually. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> well, anyway, Andrew Lloyd Webber came out for, yeah. the, um, for the final bow and got very emotional saying this is what he actually wanted to do uh, with, oh. with the production, bring it into the 21st century. Did you see the John Farnham one with uh, John Farnham as Jesus and John uh, Ingles? Uh, I think English. so. John Ingles, John. Uh, yeah, I, I, I can't remember. There was one that they did in the round. That's right. And then there was the big full-on Harry Miller That's uh, right. production. That's right. There was John English who played Judas in yes. the 70s and John Stevens played Judas 21 years ago. Uh, right. It's that long since... Uh, Time passes Time when you're having passes, fun. But this is going to be great. This is a ma this, the leads in this, okay, do you know that um, they were looking for a Jesus? Mm. Aren't we all? In London. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and they had like a competition, like a reality show, like Australian Idol. Oh, no. To, uh, yeah, and they found this guy. You know, I, I hear, pe hear people say, you know, I found God. <laughs> right. And I think to myself, I didn't know he was lost. Right. right. Well, it's just one of those. Anyway, they. Um, so anyway, getting back, they found Ben Forster, and this guy is unbelievable. I mean, he's got fans like Bono. Uh, it was a rare find, and the judges were Jason Donovan, yes, Mel C, Andrew Lloyd Webber, and do you remember the British? You know, the British actress Dawn French. She was one yes. of the judges as well, yes. and uh, David Greenwood, who uh, cast for Andrew Lloyd Webber. So but this is, look, you know, there's been a huge creative team that was assembled for this and it's And they found, the, they found the guy, because it's difficult, yeah. he's got to look the part and he's got to be able to sing. He um, sings fabulously. But the way they sort of update things, for example, Sherlock Holmes on mm -hmm. television, the new Sherlock Holmes, yeah. you know, and he's got tattoos everywhere. <laughs> is that bringing it back got, into the 21st century? Yeah, well, yeah. that's another attempt to bring yeah. something back into the, <laughs> but I can't buy it. I don't think that looks like Sherlock Holmes to me. Right, yes. Um, Maybe a younger generation or something yeah. might think that's Sherlock Holmes. Well, anyway, Tim Minchin, can I just mention this? Yeah. He plays Judas, he's a Perth boy. Yep. 
and no agent wanted to touch him. And he went over to London, wrote this amazing musical, Matilda, mm. and absolutely blitzed it. And so there you go. Yes. No yes. one wants to know you They in don't Australia. want to know you until no. they want to know you overseas. That's right. And then, right. yeah, I know. And you tell me that Julie Andrews is coming. Oh, how fabulous. A night with Julie Andrews. How spectacular is this? She's, uh, now, you know she's been in the business for such a long time. Yes. She's made her stage debut in London when she was actually only 14 years old. So she's coming to Australia. Stage. She's going to share her stories. She's going to share all her the, the, the good and bad times, I guess. And, you know, we remember her in Mary Poppins and The Sound of Music. But she's also a children's author. Yes. She wrote, you know, uh, something like um, you know, 27 books with uh, her daughter, so she's quite a talented lady. She was married to, uh, what was his name, Blake? Um, no, I don't know. I, I, I thought he was just a, a, a comedian or something like that, a okay. writer, producer, comedian, very funny man. Anyway, it's gone. Anyway, if, if you get her into the garage, I can that ask her. That would be... That's <laughs> Get her into the garage. I am going to get somebody into the garage yes. who's going to blow your mind. And if somebody comes up to you in the street, <laughs> anywhere, anytime, and says, Jeremy wants you in the garage, you'll know it's Betty. Well, you I was just admiring the garage today. It is spectacular with all your books and your cars, and I love that car. Did you drive in with that today? The MG, yeah. 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 It's so hard to get into and out of. Is it really? I mean, they must have been tiny people in 1940. <laughs> Just, just amazing. Anyway, we're so, going to go. So that's about it. So just Julie Andrews, Brisbane, Perth, Sydney, Adelaide and Melbourne. Now, qu just quickly. Yes. Social media. We wanted to yes. talk about social media. What would you like to know? Well, how does it work? What does it do? Is it good? Is it bad? Is it evil? Is it used for... You know, I've heard of people having parties and it gets out on social media. That's and right. They get invaded and things are said that are cruel and people are bullied. Yes, they are. And it's are. all in the name of social media. That's right. Well, listen, I will try and find somebody who knows the answers to all of that for you, if you'd like. Yeah. I can bring somebody in. But I've got an entertainment page that is, uh, I use it just to, you know, for my reviews and what's happening around town. Yeah. And it works wonders. It's great. Uh, personal, uh, everyone on my Facebook, I know, I've met. Uh, other people, I think the younger ones tend to not understand the repercussions of something that gets out there. Yes. It stays there. Yes, uh, yes, it's the there forever. World. Yeah. So, uh, yes, it, it is, it's quite serious. I mean, I've been bullied on uh, social media and I'm sure a few other people have. And it's not a nice no. experience. Well, there I'm are... spared because I, I don't know how to go there and I, I wouldn't read it anyway, so it doesn't much matter what, what they say. Well, the quarter part of your <coughs> opinion have got a page. Oh, good. Yes, so look that up on Facebook. Many uh, hits, many... Um, yes, oh, quite oh, a few. Oh, no, no, no. Yep. oh, did you hear that, executive producer? <laughs> hits. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. All right, lovely to see you, Betty. Lovely to see you too. Betty Samus. Now, let me look at this one piece of technology that I can handle, which is my uh, phone, uh, and give you the pet of the week. Just before I do that, I don't have time to go into it right now, but... Health researchers are calling, this is a piece of news, crazy news, uh, health researchers are calling for a ban on puppies in aged care facilities because of the potential for the outbreak of disease. Now, I don't know about you if you've got a dog. My blood pressure drops. I feel a whole lot happier when uh, Bo, my little Jack Russell, comes and sits on my lap. And I would think an aged care centre would benefit enormously. And where's the evidence that there's disease from animals simply because they are... Uh, I've, I, we'll get to that next week because I want to talk to you about that. It's just sort of officialdom gone crazy. Pet of the week. Pet of the week is Dwayne. 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 Now, I'm, I don't want to offend all the Dwaynes that we have watching, maybe, but it's a funny name for a dog. Dwayne. Hello, I'm Dwayne. I'm the Animal Welfare League Pet of the Week. I'm an eight-year-old Jack Russell Cross Terrier. Great. Uh, even though I'm a slightly older boy, I'm hoping to enjoy a nice family walk with my new owners, some good food to build me up, and some companionship. Yes, good. I'm a clever dog, all Jack Russells are, that would respond very well to training, and I love to be brushed and groomed. If you want to keep me happy, uh, why don't you let us bond and I will keep you happy. Uh, I would love a regular brushing. It's obviously into grooming. <laughs> oh, that's lovely. Okay, the Animal Welfare League. Come see me at uh, 1 to 19 Cormac Road at Wingfield. So that's the show for the week. Uh, the Court of Public Opinion is my registered trademark. Have a great week. Believe in yourself. 
on behalf of our sponsors, our cast, our crew, and of course uh, all the people that we stop in the street and ask questions of in the court of public opinion. Goodbye, believe in yourself, and bye for now.